Th thanks, Ellen, and um, thanks, guys, for being here. This is a great course. It's, it's been a real pleasure to watch it grow over the years. And I, as I was preparing these slides, I realized this is the seventh year that this has been going on. And so I think that um, a huge debt of gratitude from the organization and, and all of you should be acknowledged to Dr. Hagopian, who's put this together. Um, it, it's very hard to follow Reed Adams because he is such a great speaker and he has such a deep voice and it sounds like he's, you know, I just want to buy something off the radio when he gets done <laughs> talking. But also his lecture clearly, I mean, you talk about a master ultrasonographer and a guy who really, really understands this stuff. It's really, it's really a treat. I learn something every time I, I listen to him, to Reed and to everybody here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna infiltrate this pancreatobiliary ultrasound talk with some of the basic concepts that Dr. Hagopian, Dr. Berber, Dr. Adams have talked about because I think that learning requires repetition and so you're gonna, I'm gonna sneak a few of those things in here. I'm gonna try again to talk about a systematic approach to ultrasound and I, I will just reiterate what Dr. Adams said that there, the ultrasound, intraoperative ultrasound particularly, it's a huge amount of pattern recognition and if you go through things systematically, if you use ultrasound on every case that you do, not only will your OR team personnel become familiar with this, but you'll also start seeing things. When you recognize the normal anatomy, that's when it's easier to recognize the abnormal things. And so then we'll talk about some pathologic findings in both pancreas and the biliary system. In the pancreas, I'm gonna specifically cover chronic pancreatitis, necrotizing pancreatitis, pancreatic cysts, neuroendocrine tumors, and pancreas ductal adenocarcinoma, and then a few extra words about laparoscopy and some of the challenges that laparoscopic intraoperative ultrasound presents relative to the open contact um, scanning. So again, take a systematic approach, pattern recognition, the laparoscopic probes don't let you put the probe directly on the tissue or directly onto the standoff, and the angles, particularly in the in the the view that you're getting. I think the hardest thing about ultrasound is translating a three-dimensional structure into your brain from the two-dimensional view that you get from the probe. Because every time you turn the probe, every time you rock the probe or rotate it, suddenly you're giving yourself a different view of what's going on underneath there. So again, this is really energy. We're talking about electrical energy that is sent into a probe. The, the crystals in the probe is where all the money is, and, and it is a lot of money, 15,000 bucks for one of these probes, um, that turns the energy into sound waves at a specific bandwidth that is either absorbed by the tissue depending on how dense the tissue is or some of it is reflected from that tissue. There's some refraction in there too, but the basic concept is that the probe is listening, as Dr. Hogopian mentioned, 99% of the time the probe is in listening mode and it picks up these sound waves. The energy is again transduced through this piezoelectric system back into electricity, which is then in a, a sophisticated computer algorithm turned into the image that you see on the screen. So functionally, this is what's happening every time we do ultrasounding. So again, the basic to reiterate, again, this is Dr. Berber's lecture here, basic approaches to intraoperative ultrasound, figure out what your orientation is, adjust the depth, do the image refinement with your gain, your volume, or your fine tuning of the gain, time gain compensation. Look at your movement systematically, sliding, rocking, rotating, tilting. Use compression scanning, which is very uh, effective in some circumstances. You can use the special techniques such as standoff scanning or use of acoustic windows, scanning through adjacent organs like the stomach, for example, for the pancreas. Adjust your modes, use the duplex and color flow, which is very helpful for um, segregating biliary anatomy and vascular anatomy in the liver. This biopsy and ablation, there's a whole afternoon session with, again, some experts, uh, Dr. Ianetti, Dr. Martin, will be talking about 
biopsy and ablation techniques. Annotation and storage is critical. It's important for you. It's important if you want to bill for this. And then do a completion scan after you've done your resection, after you've taken the pancreatic head out, after you've taken the SMB and you reconstructed that, you want to make sure that the flow is appropriate, et cetera. This is a, a slide to remind me, again, this is a, a ultrasound probe, and the image that you're seeing is the image that is just behind the probe. This is to remind me, to remind you, that you get an awful lot of information, a lot of territory, simply from rocking the probe. The first, uh, if you take every novice ultrasonographer, the first thing we do is slide that probe all around because it's cool, but the problem is that you're changing what you're seeing underneath. And so if you just take the probe and rock it back and forth, this is the first thing I have the residents and the medical students do, and you get an idea, oh yeah, you can see a great deal of the liver just rocking the probe. And it's easier, I think, for your brain to comprehend that simple maneuver. The acoustic window, here's the first test of the video here, yeah. So the acoustic window, this is the duodenum and the pancreas. We're going to see the bile duct going through the pancreatic head here. This is a standoff through saline immersion here. And if you're looking at things on the superficial parenchyma, you've heard some of the other presenters. In fact, everybody, I think, this morning has, has mentioned this. And this is a, a very important point that if you're looking for something on the surface of the pancreas, now I have the pancreas here because the pancreas, as you know, is God's organ. And so I have now transitioned down from the liver to the important structures that you're looking at. But this is, this is also important on the liver. If you're looking for something on the surface of the liver, Dr. Adams showed you an excellent example of this. It's very hard to see putting the probe directly on the surface of the liver. And say, similar to the pancreas, you can use uh, saline, it's very easy to scan through the stomach. Use the stomach as an acoustic window. You don't have to flood the field. So the, the concept, again, this is reiterating some of the basic concept you've heard. The concept of an acoustic window is critically important for intraoperative ultrasound. How about a systematic approach to scanning the pancreas? The pancreas, um, uh, uh, if you take a systematic approach, you will miss fewer pathologic problems. So look at the parenchyma. Look at the pancreatic duct. Look at the vascular structures adjacent to the pancreas that are so critical for resection. Look at the bile ducts that course through the pancreatic head. And then look at the target lesion. Don't just jump and look at the tumor in the pancreatic head right out of the gate. Get a feel for what does the parenchyma look like? What does the duct structures look like? So here's the pancreatic parenchymal um, indices. What does the texture of the pancreas look like? This is a normal pancreas, is sort of a salt and pepper texture. The head, look at the neck and the body, the neck over the, over the SMV and the, and the splenic vein right there. It's a lot more challenging to see the tail of the pancreas in many cases, especially with laparoscopy. So the more you do it, the more comfortable you'll get. Look at it through the stomach. Get an idea. Look at the CAT scan while you're doing this. So you can try to imagine in your mind where, what's the relationship of the the splenic vein and the splenic artery out there in the tail. There are 10 different rose mount criteria. This is above and beyond ultrasound 101, but the rose mount criteria for chronic pancreatitis, there are two major criteria, eight minor criteria. These are developed by the endoscopic ultrasonographers, and um, there is, it's challenging to get three different ultrasonographers to agree on what is uh, a real chronic pancreatitis. But if you see, when you start seeing these reports come across your desk, that's what those guys are talking about. So see, look these things up and see if you can figure out, is there, are there calcifications in the parenchyma? Is there uh, lobularity in the parenchyma? What does that mean to you? What does the duct look like? Is the duct irregular, et cetera? So moving on to the pancreatic duct, I'm going to show you this video. And yes, uh, this is the disclosure. It is indeed a metal stent in the pancreatic duct. I did not do this, but I thought, sort of like pornography, you can't stop yourself from looking at it once you see it. Um, here's the pancreas duct upstream in the tail. Here's an irregular pancreatic duct. Here's the, yes indeed, uh, a wall stent in, in the PD. The thought is they're going to try to convert small duct chronic pancreatitis to large duct chronic pancreatitis. We can talk about this at the coffee break if you want. but. Um, Look at uh, the presence of dilation in the pancreatic duct. Where is the stricture? This is critically important if you're going to be um, 
operating on somebody with chronic pancreatitis, you don't want to leave a stricture upstream and just drain the, the head downstream in the, in the head. If there's a stricture, are you concerned that this is a malignant process? Oftentimes a stricture, you know, the, the, the specter of, of cancer in the setting of chronic pancreatitis is, is very hard to um, ignore. What is the relationship of the pancreas stuck to the lesion? Are you going to enucleate that neuroendocrine tumor? Are you going to enucleate this, the small cyst? And if you get into the pan main pancreatic duct, you're going to set yourself up for a fistula that's hard to, to, um, uh, hard to control. And then is there pancreas divism complete or incomplete or acquired pancreas divism? What about the vascular relationships, the next step in syst systematic scanning? Parenchyma, pancreas duct, here we are, the vascular relationships to the superior mesenteric vein, to the portal vein, to the splenic vein, to the artery, right? The SMA and the splenic artery, particularly if you're going to do a, a lateral pancreatic ostomy, a lot of times the splenic artery runs right through the pancreas, down in the body and the tail, and that sometimes can be problematic if you're trying to open the main pancreatic duct. Obviously, the arterial relationship to a tumor in the pancreatic head is critically important. What about variant anatomy? And again, here's a uh, transverse view. This is through the pancreatic head. This is the SMV. This is the SMA. Here is a completely replaced right hepatic artery, a re completely replaced common hepatic artery that's coursing, unfortunately, directly through a tumor in the pancreatic head. There's the <laughs> bile duct. Uh, I think in a moment you'll see a little better delineation of the hypoechoic tumor right around here. And yeah, so this was um, uh, necessary to reconstruct this entire hepatic artery in the setting of a Whipple for a man with a pancreas ductal adenocarcinoma in the head. So variant anatomy is critical. More commonly, you'll see a replaced right hepatic artery. We'll talk about some of this in a, in a few moments. You can see a... Um, uh, well, I lost my train of thought. Sorry about that. There's another another arterial uh, variant. That, oh, the the right hepatic artery that courses anterior to the common bile duct that is, is could be injured quite easily during the course of a dissection, either in a pancreatic operation or a biliary operation. What about uh, vascular thrombosis? Does that make a, a um, a change in your operative plan. What about your, I'll show you some images of a tumor that's invading the splenic artery that may change your operative plan. Look at the, again, this is pancreatic um, intraoperative ultrasound, but it's all connected. So look at the intraoperative, look at the, pre, look for presence of, of lesions in the intrapancreatic portion of the common bile duct, dilation of the bile duct, stones there. What is the relationship of the bile duct to the major papilla? This is a, a man who has cavernous transformation around the pancreatic head, and so you see some of these things. Obviously, it's going to make um, operating on the bile duct a little more complicated in the porta hepatis. And now, now that we've gone through that systematic list of the pancreas, the parenchyma, the duct, the vascular structures, the biliary tree, now let's come and take a look at the target lesion. This is the thing that we're um, here to work on what is the relationship of this lesion to the pancreatic duct. For example, is this a neuroendocrine neoplasm that you're interested in enucleating? What is the relationship of the lesion to the vessels of a pancreas duct adenocarcinoma to the SMV or the SMA or the hepatic artery as it uh, relates to the head of the pancreas? What is the relationship of this lesion to the extra pancreatic structures? For example, the duodenum, the adrenal gland, the kidney, don't forget about all that stuff that's focused right along here. So I'm gonna shift gears for a moment and talk about some specific pathologic entities, chronic pancreatitis, pancreas necrosis, cysts, neuroendocrine neoplasms. This again, here's an example of a neuroendocrine neoplasm. I thought we were gonna be able to enucleate a small neuroendocrine neoplasm, but on intraoperative ultrasound, we found that it invaded the splenic vein, and I thought it would probably be more appropriate to do a formal distal pancreatectomy for tumor clearance. Uh, pancreas duct adenocarcinoma. Here again, here are some of the Rosemont criteria, ultrasonographic criteria of the pancreas in the setting of chronic pancreatitis. Parenchymal <coughs> defects include hyperechoic foci, hyperechoic stranding, hypoechoic lobularity, of the um, 
of the parenchyma. You can see some of this lobularity here. This is a nice example here. Cysts, ductal changes such as irregularity in the pancreas duct. I think you can appreciate this as an irregular pancreatic duct with visible side branches, dilation of the main pancreatic duct denoted here by the long arrow. Hyperechoic duct margins, again, you can see this here, hyperechoic duct margins. And stone disease, again, all, all of these are, are uh, characteristics related to chronic pancreatitis. I, I um, again, I, I support very strongly the use of intraoperative ultrasound with every case you do. And the more you use it, the more you realize how nice it is to have it in the OR. It's an extension of your hand. It's an extension of your eyes. It's really critical for, for necrotizing pancreatitis. I, I take care of a lot of people with necrotizing pancreatitis. That's not surgical purview in, in many practices. But it's really critical to see how much solid necrosis is in a big walled-off necrosis versus fluid. You know, your endoscopist is going to want to start sticking stents into oil. Are there any endoscopists here in the room? All right, so I can criticize them liberally, right? The, um, no, actually, you, it's important to work with them as a team, and, and, and uh, I make fun of them all the time because we're good friends. But, um, but it's true. You know, those guys have one tool, their scope, and they're going to want to stick a stent in everything they can see. But if they stick a stent into a big wad of solid necrosis, it's going to get infected. And that's a, you know, that's, that turns into a problem. We have a great panel on Saturday afternoon. I'll make a pitch for it right now about contemporary management of necrotizing pancreatitis. Come on over and check it out. The ultrasound allows you most accurately, better than any CT scan for sure, MRI is a little bit better, but ultrasound is the best tool with which to differentiate fluid and solid necrosis. Shows you the position of entry if you're going to do laparoscopic transgastric debridement. It'll show you where to make the hole in the back of the stomach. It will show you whether the splenic vein or the SMV or the portal vein is thrombosed, and that may have implications in terms of what is your management strategy. How about pancreatic cysts? He, uh, it'll, you know, you can see with ultrasound what is the thickness of the wall. What about internal architecture that is so critical if you're thinking about what you're going to do with a um, uh, with an IPMN? What about the relationship of the cyst to the surrounding structures, including the pancreatic duct, the arterial supply, extra pancreatic organs? Here, how about a neuroendocrine neoplasm? I'm going to show you this um, film or video in just a second. How about the relationship to the pancreas duct? If you're going to enucleate a neuroendocrine tumor, you got to make sure that it's it's not impinging on the main pancreatic duct. How about the relationship to the to the vessels? I, here's the the cue is 28 seconds into this uh, image. This is a neuroendocrine neoplasm. Again, right here, you're going to see the splenic arteries up here the splenic vein, and in a, in a moment we're going to see that this is not what I expected. Here's the tumor that's invading right into the splenic vein. And in, in fact, this is the pathologic, this is the gross view of this. Here's the splenic vein. You can see that's opened with the, with the yellow rubbery neuroendocrine neoplasm right in there. And this changed what I did intraoperatively. I was going to do a, a limited uh, resection, and I, I did a bigger resection. Is that the right answer? I don't know. You know, I mean, that's an entirely different debate. Um, how about additional neuroendocrine neoplasm, especially in the liver? The in intraoperative ultrasound is clearly the, the most accurate way to image the liver, and uh, the vast majority of patients with neuroendocrine neoplasms, um, I mean, you absolutely want to see the liver because in, in a percentage of those patients, you'll see lesions in the liver that you just can't see with... Um, with MRI, even the most sophisticated MRI or CT or PET scan. Here's pancreas ductal adenocarcinoma, another specific um, pancreatic uh, pathology. This is a hypodense lesion. You can see, again, a more appropriately placed metal biliary stent, endobiliary stent draining the bile duct in this. Um, again, what about the presence of occult liver metastases? More importantly, probably, is the relationship to the vascular structures, the SMA, the hepatic artery. The tumors often have heterogeneous characteristics, but often are mostly hypodense when you see it. 
here's a note about laparoscopy, and you're going to have uh, the opportunity to do some laparoscopic ultrasound on phantoms um, this afternoon. La laparoscopic ultrasound is a lot is an order of magnitude more challenging, in my opinion, than open intraoperative ultrasound. And the reason is because you have this fulcrum of the abdominal wall, because you're struggling in your mind to rectify the three-dimensional structures with the two-dimensional probe and the two-dimensional <laughs> two image that we see on the probe. Um, and you finally wrap your head around that, and then suddenly you've got to torque the probe into a lot of different directions to see spots in the body that are not as accessible because you're limited by the fulcrum of the abdominal wall. Now, the, the, the contemporary probes are nicer because they articulate in two directions. They articulate up and down and also laterally. And so that makes it um, easier than it has been in the past when we just had the rigid probes. The, the other thing that the advanced ultrasonographer will learn to do is to use all of the port sites that you can to image the probe, to get the probe into the spots that you need to see. And each one of these port sites will offer you a little bit of a different angle on what's um, what, what's visible here in the uh, in the abdominal cavity. So again, this is just a review and a just just a reminder. Keeping it simple, um, use a systematic approach. The systematic approach to the pancreas is parenchyma, duct, vascular, biliary relationships, and then finally allow yourself to focus on that target lesion. I'm gonna. Uh, this is. Um, intraoperative ultrasound that I'll, I'm going to pass by in the interest of time, but we could potentially come back to that. Uh, I'm going to shift gears and, and uh, again, focus on biliary intraoperative ultrasound, looking at, again, reminding you about some basic principles, but looking at biliary anatomy, vascular anatomy, which is notoriously variable, as all of you know, in the right upper quadrant, talk about some specific pathology, and then show some intraoperative ultrasound images. This is the ALOCA, uh, where the Indiana University is in ALOCA uh, shop. And so, the, again, a lot of this stuff is similar, but you need to become familiar with your specific probe. And you can see, just like uh, Ellen pointed out here, we've labeled this. Here's the button that freezes things. We don't get a snowflake, but we uh, compensate for that by putting a big freeze. So when I tell the circulating nurse to freeze, they know what button to press. Here's the picture button, and we label this. Here's the invert the image, depth and gain, and so forth. Here's a, a nod to compression scanning. Again, this is up on the liver. Be conscious of how much pressure you're putting on the probe. Here's an hepatic vein and a portal vein. Again, you can see the glistens capsule, the hyperechoic structures around the portal vein. And when you compress this probe, that goes away completely. You can use this to your advantage in some cases, but also don't be fooled by an in inordinate amount of pressure um, that, that you're putting on the parenchymal structures. Here's an orientation slide. You can, use, you, you can get oriented by uh, little dots and things on your, on your um, machine, but it's also good to come back to some patterns that you recognize. For me, one of these patterns is the left lateral section of the liver. This is a proper orientation with the triangle pointed sort of to the right upper portion of the, um, of the screen. This is reverse orientation with, and so you know that you're backwards and it, it'll totally screw your head up until you sort out exactly what the orientation is here. Here's the orientation piece, God bless you, on the pancreatic head. This is a, a, a happy picture for me. I understand that this is the superior mesenteric vein and splenic vein junction here. You can see the pancreas parenchyma, the pancreas duct. And so if I see this, this is a point of reference for me. If I get lost in the middle of my ultrasound, I just come back and find a point where I'm comfortable, where I know what the anatomy is, and then I can go, go on and look at the other things. Here it is scanning a little bit more to the patient's right. You can see the genu of the pancreatic duct coursing down. This is the uh, likely the gastroduodenal artery anterior to the pancreas. And then again, um, it becomes important, particularly in biliary ultrasound, to understand the, the direction that your probe is oriented. And image things, it's critical to image things. The ablators are going to tell you this this afternoon. Image things in two dimensions. It's, it's really critical to image them in, 
in, in two orientations, and you'll get a different view of things. This is a stone in the common bile duct in the transverse and longitudinal orientation, and I have some, some uh, video images of that. Uh, and again, here's, uh, this is uh, my um, uh, gratuitous and requisite probe of, of or a video of laparoscopy. Here's the laparoscopic probe, and you can see the, the position the probe is being articulated here, and the point of this image is to show you that um, you, you're scanning this. This is not the angle that I would take automatically if I had an open probe. If I had an open T probe, I would not have this angle on it. And so you have to be comfortable looking at these images with the probe getting rotated in different angles. The biliary anatomy, as you all know, is notoriously variable, and uh, the biliary anatomy in the liver very commonly follows the sectoral and the, and the glissonian pedicles. However, there, is, there, there, there are separate right and left, I'm sorry, right anterior and posterior sections. There is a remarkable, uh, probably the most common biliary anatomy is replaced right posterior sectoral ducts that can enter into the common hepatic duct, it can drain into the cystic duct, it can drain into the gallbladder. I just read a paper in the Journal of GI Surgery, the top 10 most terrifying gallbladder I've seen or, or whatever, but every, everybody sees this. Ultrasound can help you sort this out. You follow the glissonian pathways in the liver. It's not normal to see the bile ducts in the liver. But you can't. But they are they are enveloped in the glissonian capsules with the portal veins. If you see bile ducts in the liver, they're dilated, and that's abnormal. That's a pathologic finding. However, you can follow the glissonian capsule, the glissonian pattern of that in the liver, and uh, and follow the bile ducts down. The hepatic arterial anatomy again also notoriously variable. Um, this is a standard hep uh, hepatic arterial anatomy, the common hepatic artery, gastroduodenal artery, proper hepatic artery, the right gastric comes off over here, and then the right hepatic artery, which commonly, or the standard anatomy, dives deep to the common bile duct, and the left hepatic artery. A common variant is a replaced right hepatic artery from the SMA, usually. Dr. Adams showed you a picture of a replaced left hepatic artery, which can come directly from the aorta, directly from the celiac. Sometimes that's helpful, sometimes it's a pain in your backside. <laughs> this is a hepatic arterial uh, aberrant right hepatic artery anterior to the common bile duct. I alluded to this a little bit earlier here. This is a star on the common bile duct, and this is something, you can see this. You can see this with an ultrasound, even in a densely um, fatty porta hepatis. This will give you a clue and you can avoid injuring an artery that, that you otherwise may, uh, may injure. What about biliary pathology? Stones, polyps, gallbladder cancer, and cholangiocarcinoma, inflammatory disease, cholidocal cyst, biliary cyst adenoma, sphincter vodi dysfunction I think is a topic perhaps for another lecture. This is some uh, intraoperative, all these intraoperative ultrasounds, by the way, are done by our fellows. And I'm, I'm, uh, I say that not to, here's the nice orientation, the left lateral section of the liver with that, um, uh, with that point up there. This is, uh, these are dilated bile ducts in the liver, so this is pathologic. And you can see that it's, it's mirroring, it's following the, um, the, the route of the portal veins and the hepatic arteries in the liver. And I, I tell you that these uh, these ultrasounds are by our liver by, by our fellows. I deliberately included this uh, not to impugn them in the quality of the ultrasound, but just to show you that anybody can do these. You know, and, and so these are unedited. Um, I thought about editing them, but I'm probably too lazy to do that. But but you can just see here's the the hepatic veins coming down into the portal veins in the hilum here, and I think we're going to get to some stones in the bile duct, and I think. Most likely, we're going to see some some uh, common duct stones here too. I think that's what this problem was. Middle hepatic vein, right here.
can see the rotation of that probe. Here's the gallbladder. Here's a hyperechoic structure with posterior shadowing. The three components of a stone is that it's mobile. Somebody's finger is poking it around there. Hyperechoic with posterior shadowing. And I, I know, I'm hoping that we're going to get to the common duct stone here in a second, but. I don't want to disappoint you. Ah, well, in any event, here's a, a gallbladder polyp, oftentimes hyperechoic. You can see the relationship of the polyp similar to cancer. It's helpful to know what is the relationship to the liver bed. Here's a gallbladder cancer. Again, looking at the relationship of where is this lesion in, in relationship to the liver parenchyma? Is it on the dependent portion of the gallbladder side? Where is the lesion in relationship to the cystic duct? You can look at celiac lymphadenopathy. You can look at retropancreatic lymphadenopathy. They're not all this clear, I'll tell you that. I, this is a, a select picture. You can look at relationship to other lesions in the liver. Are there satellite lesions? in segment four, segment five, or beyond that have implications in terms of the resection that you do. Uh, what about cholangiocarcinoma? Cholangiocarcinoma, this is a very similar, this is an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, and again, the um, cholangiocarcinoma is, is typically hypodense, hypoechoic. Uh, you're familiar with the, with the staging one, two, 3A, 3B. It's harder to see the hilar cholangiocarcinomas. Maybe Dr. Adams will comment on this too, but I find it um, very difficult to, to look at the extent of the lesion intraparenchymally, which is oftentimes the money of the resection. But it is important for hilar cholangiocarcinoma or perihilar to look at the relationship to the hepatic artery. And, and again, are you going to be able to, um, it, does the patient need a trisag or, or can you? deal with the problem uh, with a lesser resection. How about inflammatory disease? Uh, this is a Maritzi type picture, obviously. This is a cholangiogram. You can see uh, dense inflammation with abscess into the liver here. Cholidocal cysts. This is a summary of the, uh, the five types of cholidocal cysts. The most common, type one, type two is a almost a diverticulum type three, as we know, is a cholidocal seal, type four, intrahepatic and extrahepatic, and then type five, Corollis disease with the cysts that are purely intraparenchymal in the liver. Biliary cyst adenoma, small but real percentage of malignancy associated with these lesions. And again, um, here is some uh, uh, hyper attenuating, um, intraluminal septations there. A lot of times the things that are more concerning is when you have mural nodularity in these biliary cyst adenomas. And that, that's all I have for you for the pancreas and biliary um, lesions. I'm gonna play this last, um, this, this last intraoperative ultrasound and maybe we can leave it running. If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to to answer this while this is running in the background. Great. We can multitask, right? It's yes, 2018. Of